Welcome to a well-designed business with your host, Luan Nigara. Luan has a lifetime of experience building a multi-million dollar business with her husband and cousin, and she knows the challenges you face in your interior design business. Luann brings you real-life answers to your most pressing problems, as well as practical strategies to explode your interior design business. So, let's get to the business of interior design. Hi, welcome to another episode of A Well-Designed Business. If you are a new listener to the show, welcome. I'm so glad you found us. Today's show, I have Corey Klassen from Vancouver, Canada, and Judith Neary from Vashon Island off the coast of Seattle. Today, we're going to discuss their businesses for sure, but this show is mostly about the CEU that they have created, which is sponsored by My Doma Studio. The CEU is called Beyond Design, Establishing Monetary Value you for your creative skills. Very often, I pair a designer's bio down when introducing them, but both Corey and Judith are quite accomplished, and I thought it, in order for you to truly appreciate the value of the CEU that they have um, formulated, it would be helpful for you to really understand what each of them has accomplished. So first is Judith's bio. Judith is a certified master kitchen and bath designer with experience in commercial, hospitality, medical, and residential design. After working with a national retailer in merchandising design and training, she switched to the manufacturing segment of the industry. Her responsibilities included developing and implementing business processes, installation programs, showroom space planning, and design. Judith is a frequent contributor to trade publications of the industry and by writing and speaking on various topics of interest for both the design professional and the homeowner. As one of the professional instructors, for the National Kitchen and Bath Association, Judith offers a comprehensive learning experience to international markets. She currently serves on the Gen Air Design Advisory Council, providing feedback from the designer's perspective on the Gen Air appliance brand as well as all other Whirlpool Corporation brands. Her design practice celebrates the eclectic arts and food of war culture of the Vashon Island community, where her studio and her home is located. Judith is known for doing weird really well. So you're going to find that you're going to like her personality a lot. I really did. Now, Corey. Corey is also a certified master kitchen and bath designer, associate member of the International Interior Design Association, and an accredited decorator from the Canadian Decorators Association. He has experience in commercial and residential design. He comes from a long line of creatives and was featured locally at the age of 17 years old after interning with an architecture firm in Winnipeg, Manitoba. He opened his firm in 2011, and since then he has won multiple international awards for his design work, and he has been mentioned in the Wall Street Journal, Globe and Mail, Vancouver Sun, Gray Magazine, Homes and Design Magazine, and many more. He is an adjunct instructor in the local interior design program, and he regularly contributes to Ask a Pro with the NKBA. Corey is working toward his National Certification of Interior Design Qualification, And he has led and launched endeavors such as the NKBA British Columbia Chapters Annual Design Competition. Corey is a brand ambassador and design council member for Blanco Canada Incorporated, DXV by American Standard, and Perlick. He receives advanced product information and training on new initiatives and developments within the industry. Corey is known for creating symmetry in awkward spaces with use of strong line and form and a pleasing material palette inspired by the Pacific Northwest. And he is going to share with us some very direct business advice that I think you're going to appreciate. Now, Judith and Corey together frequently co-lecture across North America America about the business side of interior design to other like-minded industry professionals, just like you guys. So we're very lucky to have the two of them with us today on the show. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Cherish, the place where designers go to buy and sell quality vintage furniture, and then I'll be right back with Corey and Judith. I'd like to thank my sponsor, Cherish, and to let you know about this gem of a resource. Cherish, which can be found at www 
C H A I R I S H dot com slash trade is the premier online marketplace where design pros just like you can go to source the best vintage decor and furniture. With more than 125,000 curated items for sale, Cherish makes it easy, fun, and fast for you to find stylish pieces at great deals to suit every client and every project. The items are ready to ship, intent, which means no waiting, and Cherish offers a two-day return policy. Here's some more good stuff. Cherish trade members enjoy special benefits, including cash back on every purchase, white glove delivery, and exclusive concierge service. Sign up for their trade program today at www.cherish.com slash trade. Hi, Judith. Hi, Corey. Thank you so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Hi, Luann. Thanks for having us. Really, thank you, Luann. Thank you for inviting us to this, uh, I don't know, this virtual meeting. Yes, right? So it's kind of cool technology, what it's done lately. And that's a little bit what we're going to get into here, too, as a matter of fact. So I have explained to everybody in the introduction that you two are professional instructors with the NKBA and that um, you're both interior designers with your own practices. But the other thing that we have in common is my Doma Studio. And everybody knows now that myself and my husband and our partner, Bill, have invested in my Doma Studio because I just love this platform. Sarah Sarah Daniele has quickly become one of the people that I most respect in this industry. So bright. And of course, Sarah and I were talking recently and she said to me, I had to meet you guys. <laughs> and so I was like, all righty, more rock stars, right? So she, you guys are going to be running a CEU course that is hosted by my Doma and it is a webinar course so people can take it from the you know their pajamas in their living room and we're going to talk about that course for sure because I really want to get to the bottom of it and all the different things that you're teaching and but before that I understand from our off-air discussion that both of you run very different uh, we have both have high end luxury firms, but you operate in very different types of locales and that you express to me that that sort of informs something what you each bring to the table as teachers together of this course and the other courses that you teach together. So I wanted to give you a chance to talk about that and express that for us. So Corey, tell us you're in Vancouver. Tell us about what your demographic is like and what your client base is like. And then Judith, you'll tell us the contrast of yours. Well, that's a great uh, question, Luann, but um, I won't tell you my demographic. I'll tell you my psychographic. How's oh, that? Okay. Yeah. Uh, you're going to have to so, tell me what a psychographic is first, please. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's no problem. Well, other than looking at age, race, uh, sex, religion, those types of typical types of demographics or where someone might live. I'm looking more at how a client might fit into my fold. Okay. And I'm looking at, are they agreeable? Can they make decisions? Uh, do they, do they uh, have amiable aspects that I can, uh, of their personality that I can work with in my firm? Because I always say that it is not just me that they're working with, they're my entire team. So it's really important that uh, we have those initial conversations with clients to understand where they kind of end up. And I really have to listen to for the red flags, right? That instinct, I really right. have to judge it. So it's super important. And because I'm in a big city, we get a lot of a lot of inquiries and a lot of leads, and some of them are pretty dead in the water before mm. they even uh, get a phone call back. So mm. it's a lot to manage. Yeah. Okay. And, and so, so how is that different for you, Judith? What's your firm like? And tell us a little bit about that. Well, I really like that you, you think I'm a high end luxury firm because that's pretty spectacular. Um, <laughs> I looked at your website. It looks gorgeous. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Um, you know, Corey talked about psychographics and aligning instead of demographics. In other words, like age, uh, how much money you make, uh, where you live, how much real estate. Um, so psychographics is, again, about li aligning to your core values. Well, I do weird really well. That's my specialty <laughs> is I do weird really well. I live on an island, uh, 10,000 residents. We're across from Seattle. You can only get to the island by a boat, and you can only get off the island by a boat. And it's an incredibly eclectic mix of uh, 
God, it's just an incredibly collect. Um, I, I can't. I can't even begin to describe it. It sounds I mean, like is that like how like Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket are, where you have to you know take the boat back and forth and make the ferry at a certain time and all that stuff. Yeah, you do. It's more like we're like a, a little mini episode of Portlandia. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Those are really my people. Okay. I mean, the kind of clients I have are, are like, well, I want my kitchen to match my aura. And so. I mean, <laughs> I don't even know how to deal with that sometimes. Do you speak you know? aura, like, by the way, Judith? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? what Do you, can you speak in aura so that you can match the kitchen to the aura? Well, actually, I have a rent-a-psychic to help me out with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I have to say, change. I have to say, I, I'm not completely opposed to the idea that people have auras, but I just don't know that I need my kitchen to match it. <laughs> this is true, because if they have a bad day it could be a black aura before you know it that's right (laughs) (laughs) so it is a bit challenging um but but the the fundamental differences i really think you know between Corey and i because when we started on this journey um it started out a couple of years ago and i said to Corey, i said i have this idea i want to i want to create this class called rent my brain reduce the pain which is what i use in my business as a, um an ad ad buzzword and in this process of developing this course or or working through this Corey and i had to evolve our personal um perspective on business and along with our professional perspective on business and we got stuck into this old think pattern of behavior okay and the i'm sure Luann, you you've noticed probably in the last five or six years that the industry really changed mm. um we came out of the depression mm-hmm. and now all of a sudden the rules are all different and so those of us that have been in the trades for a while it's like the, the things that we used to do just aren't effective anymore. Right. And so we've had to reinvent our uh, not only our personal values, but how we do business with people. Like an example, Corey's social media and networking for his business, you know, happens um, through referral base, through his website, um, through all of his posts and exposure in the industry. Okay, so my social media networking happens in water aerobics. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, you know, so that's where I get my business. So Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's just, it's completely different. The rules are so different and we can't go about things like we used to. So we have to look at how we do things differently. And some of that is how do we adapt ourselves and how do we modify ourselves to embrace a new business reality? So uh, my question is, how did you two get connected? And Judith, okay, let me ask one question. How long, Judith, are you living in this community? Is this where your home is for you've lived there forever? Or what's your situation with that? I've been here 20 years. I am uh, migrated out of Southern California after the North Ridge earthquake and said, oh, I'm done. <laughs> and now I live on an island with a fault line between me and an active volcano and the largest nuclear waste facility on the other side of the mountain. So Wait, it was, so really that, was that an improvement? Forward thinking on, <laughs> yeah, forward thinking on my part. Um, I really only practiced in my community for the last three years. But oh. for the most part... Pra- uh, uh, practiced off island for many years. Okay, so but these are your people. This is your tribe. You've lived here for these twenty years, <laughs> so you speak aura. You actually do speak aura. <laughs> I do, do speak aura, but I refuse to wear tie dye. Okay, I, okay. I, I have to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> Well, you're a respectable interior designer. Let's just go there. <laughs> so now the question is, how did you two connect? Because it does, are they, I mean, it, it's not, geo, I don't even know where Vancouver is. I'm sorry, Corey. Is it geographically near Seattle? Is it on that side of Canada? <laughs> yeah, we're three hours north of Seattle. Okay. So um, we're, technically speaking, we're really only about 30 minutes from the border. So I don't know if you know this, but most Canadians live very near the U.S. border. It's right. a um, very interesting phenomenon. I think it has to do a lot to, a lot to do with climate. But so Judith uh, came up to Vancouver to give one of her amazing courses. And I happened to be just starting with the NKBA chapter actually at that time as VP professional development. And 
I came into the class. I introduced myself to everybody, all the new attendees, because I was the new incoming. Okay. And there was Judith. And I think it was just synchronous from there, because I really think that I'm I'm the hippie on the inside sometimes, <laughs> and I really don't belong in the big city. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of a dichotomy sometimes between us. So. Okay, so so you guys connect, you hit it off, and now these however many years later, you two are often lecturing and giving courses together. And so what you're describing is that because you literally function from two different types of psychographics and demographics, right, that Mm -hmm. you are bringing, so nobody can sit in your class and say, well, you don't know what it's like to work, be an interior designer in a small town, or you don't know what it's like to be a designer in a big city. You have both sides of the perspectives together. Are there other ways that you feel the contrast of your two business inform the way you teach together and the content that you come up with to uh, teach designers with? I'm going to jump on that, Corey. <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> um, so uh, Corey and I are extremes in a couple of ways. Uh, he is very, very tech-oriented, very tech-savvy. I'm low-tech. I mean, I pull out a pencil on a paper and, <laughs> and a sharp pull up my You're my kind of girl. <laughs> and and, um, and and so I think that contrast, there's an inherent contrast between just – um, our skills and how we go about the business, but the, some of the similarities are that in a professional capacity, we want to relate to not only the homeowner and, and, and get the project done, but then also, um, God, I totally lost that train of thought. Well, there you go. There's some of our differences right there. (laughs) (laughs) It happens, believe me, to the best of us. (laughs) It was brilliant, too. I'll come back to it eventually. Just wait for me. But go ahead. Jump in there. Well, but I'm getting it. I'm going to tell you what I'm hearing from it. And I think that it is pretty brilliant because the fact of the matter is, is you described a few things in there. You described that, you know, the high tech, low tech. And I like that because when I go to learn something new, if I feel like I'm the only person in the room that is low tech, then I, you know, I will give it my, you know, 110% effort. But if there's a point that the light bulb doesn't go off and everybody keeps running down the road ahead of me, you know, you just check out. You're just like, whatever, this was a dumb class. I never should have taken this. Not that the class content was dumb, but that I, it wasn't my level. I I shouldn't have been here. So I think that that's, I would personally like to know that if I were going to invest money in a CEU that might be a little stretch for me financially and or brain wise to understand that it's has been developed by people, both sides of it. Somebody that really is edge on the tech and is going to broaden my mind a little bit, but the other person that is always going to say, yeah, but how did you teach that and what do you do? So I like that. I think that's a perfectly, you know, terrific contrast to bring up, you know? I think there's a bit of a challenge sometimes too, when you're a professional that's been in the field for a long time, it's, it's really hard to find content or, or course materials to maintain your CEUs in order to get more CEUs. Because you've seen it all, you've done it all, you've taken every class, and you find that you're repeating things and there's nothing new to learn. Mm. So some of what we what we talk about is really about, about breaking your business and then putting it back together. Or maybe finding, really trying to dig through and finding what didn't work or doesn't work for you and how to build that back up. So it, it, it's, it's just an interesting way of... of recalibrating or resetting hitting the reset button right okay so so one thing before we start to take apart the ceu and the different components of it i would love to go circle back to with you and Corey. you mentioned and i'm going to circle back to this because it comes up on the show a lot you mentioned how you are very interested in the psychographic of your potential clients and we have conversations here all the time about If it's not a right fit, it's okay to say no. If it's not a right fit, it's okay to refer them to somebody else. If, you know, if it's not a right fit, don't plow through it because no one benefits. You don't benefit. The client doesn't benefit. So do you have some 
clear steps. How do you identify for yourself the psychographic of a potential client coming in and what you know your red flags will be different than somebody else's red flags that's the whole point of it for for sure uh-huh. but how do you because you there must be an intake process how does your team do it or is it do you handle the first one and it's just a, like what, what is it gut feeling or are there questionnaires because that's a that's a big topic and i'd love for you to share that with us sure i i think i think first off yes there has to be a process when you have a team and you're you, you get like seven or eight leads a week that's a lot mm. for, for us to take on. I can't call those seven or eight people. It's impossible. I got to get work done. Right. So uh, establishing a process very early on is is really trying to understand uh, our, our client's psychographic. So one of the things that we realized quickly is because we use an online studio software to work with our clients, uh, which is actually my doma. Of course uh, it is. <laughs> well, yeah, of course it is. Mm-hmm. But we realized very, very quickly, if they're not technologically savvy, they're likely not our client. Very, okay. very quickly. So that's like a so, deal breaker for you. Like you're not going to muddle it through. <laughs> it can be. I mean, my doma is really great. It's really fluid. It's really intuitive. There's not a lot of things that, uh, that someone can't navigate. So if you can use Google, you can use my doma. That's what I always say. Oh, uh, okay. But but one of the things was if they cannot simply fill out our our uh, intake form on our website, boom, red flag right there. Okay. Because I make it really easy. I ask very straightforward questions. There are requirements that we need to know because, like I said, because we get so many in- pieces of, of uh, intakes per week, I really need to drill down and find the right ones. So... Part of it is, obviously, we need to know budget and we need to know timeline. Those are big, big ones right up front. Okay. From from the moment that we get an intake, uh, it's going to be an email follow-up. So if the email follow-up just goes gets lost in cyberspace, well, then we know you're not a fit for us already and no big loss because there's 10 behind you. Right? Okay. That's the, more... the thing in a big city. Right. Okay. Yeah. 10 more leads behind you. Right. So from there, we set up a, we schedule a 30-minute telephone interview. I go through and I ask them some pretty poignant questions like, uh, uh, give me a run through of your project again. Great. We're going to check all those off, going to take notes. But tell me how you how you uh, make decisions. Tell me how you make decisions. Do you make the decisions by committee? Do you make decisions based upon our professional recommendation? Or are you actually going to go back, research everything that we actually talked about, then come back to us two weeks later with your final decision? Can so, I just st- stop you right there? So the thing is, the sure. way you present that almost intonates that if you're the third one you're not my person so do you right so do you present it neutrally so that you actually get a true because if I'm just saying like I'm just gonna say if I really admired your work and I wanted to work with you and you anything (laughs) well that's what I'm gonna say that's my point if I really wanted to work with you and I heard you ask that question where you just led me out the door if I take two weeks I'm not gonna tell you I take two weeks I'm gonna say Oh, I'm not, I'm not. So do you ask it neutrally so that somebody might think you actually respect somebody that takes two weeks to make a decision and this way they feel comfortable to answer? Or do you actually lead them like if you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I do <laughs> know what you're saying because I think making decisions is an important part of a process because a, a decision maker can make or break the next client or a current, a current project that we're trying to complete. So right. yeah, there is a softer way of saying it for sure. But those are the target points that I'm looking for. Okay. Uh, from there, if I'm not really able to get an answer out of that, the next question I'm going to ask, what do you think are going to be your biggest challenges in the project? Mm-hmm. That is going to give me another backup to the decision maker. Because if they're able to understand, hey, I think budget's going to be a problem. I think I, I don't understand my style. I think that's going to be a problem. Or I think the actual site's going to be a problem because I know that someone did work in this place beforehand and I don't know what it looks like. If they have a semblance of that information already preset, I can pretty well tell what kind of decision maker they're going to be because they may have done a little bit of pre-work already. Mm-hmm. What if so, somebody just says, I'm not thinking there's going to be problems. That's why I'm hiring you. Like, I know that's silly, but I'm just saying I'm talking about the silly person mm-hmm. that says it. Does anybody ever say anything like that? Like, I don't like, why would there be problems? Why would there be, or do, does everybody, by the time they get to a firm at your level, they understand that they've probably had some experience with interior design before and they know that there's going to be challenges? Well, no, not necessarily. A lot of people understand that working through a, a structure 
has challenges with it, but a lot of people don't actually understand that mm -hmm. point. So the reason why we talk about that up front is so that we can start preparing them mentally and emotionally for when that, that moment does happen. Yes. And when we are running into a challenge on the job site, that you have a professional that works alongside you to help you troubleshoot the problems and, and you can remind forward. them that I, you, we, we, we talk like yeah, we have a, exactly. we have a thing in our house. It's like, we talked about this. <laughs> it's like, you know, when yeah. something is like stressing somebody out and you've said, Hey, don't worry when this happens, that happens. And we're like, we talked about this. <laughs> so you can look exactly. at your client and say, look, we, we knew ahead of time that this part of the project or this arm of the project was going to be particularly challenging. Let's just back it up and get our heads about ourselves. Right. Right, exactly. Okay. It's not, you know, we, don't, we don't want to lose our cool or anything. Mm -hmm. We just want to get everybody on the right page and make the right decision for the whole entire project. And that includes, you know, timeline, money, form, and function. So. And I know we're really going down a rabbit hole here, and I apologize, but I think it's really valuable. And I know these are the kinds of things that the listeners want to know because it's what they email me and ask me. And you seem to have a good lockdown on it. So if somebody were to say on their intake form that they wanted to do a kitchen and then when you said what is the budget and they said ten thousand dollars do you what do you do you not even call them back or do you just let them know sorry that's crazy pants go to lowe's i mean what do you do generally what i say is thank you for your inquiry obviously uh i understand this is the type of project that you want to do uh keep in mind that uh kitchens generally cost between this range and this range if you're on board with that let me know and we'll schedule a telephone interview otherwise okay. i like it have a great day <laughs> okay no i like it because you just you come back and you don't tell them that their budget is absurd you just tell them what the actual budget should be expected and if they they want to regroup that's fine and if not okay okay right. i like it and then one more question on this topic before we go back is when You've gone through that 30 minute phone call and you find that somebody is not your ideal client, but they haven't come to that decision. In other words, they don't realize it. You have all red flags and they still think everything's kosher. What, how do you extricate yourself, Corey? Usually the, what I'm going to say is great. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of other projects on board at the moment that I need to, to sort through. I'm going to get back to you via email. So that gives me a bit of time to formulate in my head what I'd like to say. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I draft it six, seven times, right. rewrite it, spend three hours right. on it, that kind of thing. <laughs> right. right. So, but then yeah, I'm able to respond a little bit more respectfully that way and say, right. you know, thanks for your interest. I really don't know if this is a project that we'd be interested in because of this point, this point, this point. Or um, I found now recently that actually pinpointing why actually gives a reply or a response. So it's most likely going to be thank you for, again for your interest. I really appreciate the time. Uh, I don't think that your project is a good fit for us, but here's someone who I think would be. Okay. So. I love it. Everybody says to do this on the show. I just feel like you're one of the few people that I actually can hear does it. So good on you. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right. So, um, so now Judith, though, you face the completely opposite problem in a place of 10,000 people. I mean, in some places that's a high school for crying out loud. <laughs> 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 well, so so for Corey's interview process, really, mine is uh, the first step for me is I Google Earth them to see if I can even find the house. <laughs> so that's my because <laughs> it's usually like turn right at the Jesus Barn Farm, left at the Big Rock, and turn right at the Fallen Tree. I'm like oh you just described God. every back road on Bashan, so. Hmm. So, but that's got to be a whole different challenge. Uh, you know, I just think it's, I love it because if you are in tier design for three years, have a, do you have a full pipeline, you're doing business, you know, it sort of blows out of the water. Any interior designer that says, you know, I'm living here in a town of 20,000 people, 40,000 people, and I can't, you know, fill a pipeline. But how, how do you do it? Is it a high 
money demographic area where everybody there, even though they're free spirited and all that other stuff, are still going to hire professional services? Or, I mean, really, how do you keep a pipeline full with 10,000 people? Well, uh, it's interesting the, because it is a very, and I, I don't like to use the word demographic, but the reality is demographics does play into it. We have a very, very incredibly rural community. And with 10,000 residents, I mean, it blossoms in the summer to about 14. But the primary folks that live here are oftentimes it's a second home or their Microsoft money and they're hiding out in the woods or their Amazon money and their tech heads and they work for Facebook. And so they're, you know, off on their little secluded acreage. Okay. And so for me, you know, my studio is in the center of town, which is the first stop sign as you get off the boat. Okay. <laughs> so from 15 minutes from the center of Vashon's universe, I can get down one end of the island and up to the other end of the island. So for me, if someone calls or is interested or communicates with me, they don't go through an interview process on my website because I don't have that set up. <laughs> they, I just go get in my car, go down, like I said, Google Earth them, make sure I can find the place, um, and I go visit them, and I just spend half an hour, 45 minutes in their home, and we have a conversation, hmm. and in that conversation, you know, I go through my mental checklist after being in the industry for 30-something years of, like, these are the questions I need to ask, and I, I just very candidly say to them, you know, it's more important to see if we can work together, hmm. uh, and if this is a good fit, hmm. and... I have a couple of favorite contractors that I work with on the island because they show up mm -hmm. and they do the work and they have excellent ethics. And that's one of the biggest challenges uh, in a small community is getting qualified help. Mm -hmm. So it is a completely different mindset than uh, an approach to doing business and say in, in, than in Corey's geography. And it is, it is very challenging because I can't afford to piss anybody off. No. I don't want to get hit at the intersection. Right. Okay? <laughs> oh, my God, there's my designer. I'm going to run her over. <laughs> Not a good thing. Uh, so for me, it's a social engagement, and I have to make sure that um, I can work with them, and it's an amiable solution. That's and so really I would think it would be as as uncomfortable as it is for a designer in any you know, area to ultimately say to a potential client, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, I don't think this is going to work out for us. We're not a great fit. That's got to be extremely difficult when you're probably are going to see them at the water yoga class the next day. I mean, really? Like, how do you know that? It's like, I don't want to be your friend. <laughs> you know, well, I did have that happen. And I'm, my studio has a massage studio above me, so that's even better, right? So I got major woo-woo happening here. <laughs> <clears throat> this one client would come and visit me after she went and got a massage, and she was just so out there. She couldn't make a decision about anything. And God love her, but I finally I said, you know, I can't help you. you can't, you're not making decisions. I can't help you. Mm. And so I think you need to just work it out with your contractor. And, you know, you know, if you run into a big problem, call me, but you just need to work it out with him on the job site. Yeah. The other challenge is, is knowing when to refer someone else. Um, is there even another and, designer in 10,000 people? <laughs> well, there is, but she, she's wired completely differently. Hmm. And so she's going to attract a demo or a psychographic that works for her, mm -hmm. but her psychographic is completely different than mine, so we really don't cross over, thankfully. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And so oftentimes in a situation, particularly after being in the industry for a long time, I have connections off the island. And let's say I have a homeowner that isn't getting what they need necessarily from me, but maybe they are off island and they're trying to take care of a home here or something. I oftentimes will refer them to someone else and wish them the best of luck. Okay. Okay. Two truly different sets of challenges as designers. One who, you know, just has, you know, the phone and the intake coming day after day and you who has to really try and 
you know, be a lot of things to a lot of people, but still be true to yourself and your and your ideals and what you're looking for out of your business and stuff. So that's interesting. So then that does lead us into the CEU that the two of you have developed because the CEU is called Beyond Design, but it's called Establishing Monetary Value for Creative Skills. And some of the things that you guys cover in your CEU really do talk back to the things that we just discussed a little bit. So you have four components of the CEU. How many, uh, how many hours does the CEU take? And it's a webinar. It's happening on May 10th. And I understand the May 10th one is more for an entry level or a newer interior design. And the May 18th meeting of the CEU is for a more seasoned interior design. Is that, do I understand that correctly, you guys? Yes. Yeah, you've got that right. Okay. And it, it's two hours. Uh, it's IDEC approved, so anybody with any uh, AISD, AISD or IDI BC, or well, that's locally here. What do I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so is so, it's approved ASID, the, 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 the all that. So is what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's cross referenced over to, and even with a certificate of completion, anybody with an NKDA certification can actually submit it as well. Okay. And yeah. so let's go through it. So the first one of the first components that you take. Well, first of all, do we do do we describe the the different um, overview of the four components, or do we tell them first that they have to complete some homework before arriving what what makes more sense timeline to discuss the things that they would need to bring or the overview of it i think it might be better to discuss a bit of the overview and layer in that there is some homework to be done first okay so one of the first things that you guys are going to talk about in the ceu is identify a baseline for your personal skill sets mm, yes right so talk and about that's... who wants to talk about that a little bit <laughs> I will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the evaluation of your personal skill sets uh, really came about as a result of needing to create a menu of services. Okay. And oftentimes the homeowner, you know, don't, they don't, they truly do not understand what it is that we do. Okay. And so sometimes we don't understand what it is that we do, and we can't necessarily articulate to a homeowner, well, I do a mechanical plan and blah, 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 because it's important to the electrician. I mean, they just don't get it, right? Right. So so by creating a menu of services, I really I had to sit down and evaluate what it is that I like to do, what is it that I don't like to do, and what is the stuff that I really don't want to do at all. Right. And and be able then to articulate that and communicate that to a homeowner in a way that makes sense that doesn't diminish my professional capacity or undervalue my professional capacity. Because let's face it, you, Luann, you know this. There's some things you're really efficient at and you're really good at and you can – get that done and get it out of the way. And it's a good value proposition for the homeowner and for you and for your business. Mm -hmm. But there's just some stuff that takes a hell of a long time to get, Mine. you know, get done. Yeah. Cause you don't, one, you don't want to do it, or maybe you don't have the skill sets to do it. Right. So, so part of the course has a self-evaluation um, before you attend the course so that you can go through and say, okay, as a professional designer, we bro we've broken it out into three areas, um, concepts, execution, and administration. So if you look at just the three core elements of an interior design or kitchen and bath, any, any type of design business, it starts with concepts, um, uh, execution, and administration. So we took all of these skill sets that are typical to our industry and thanks ASID for helping us with that and, mm -hmm. and um, l literally listed them out and you evaluate yourself on hey I like to do it I'm really good at it I don't really want to do it and I don't want to do it at all so you do a little bit of a self-evaluation I have to tell you you need to do the self-evaluation more than once because some weeks you're like, hey, I'm on top of that. <laughs> Next week you're like, what was I thinking? Okay. okay. <laughs> Very telling. And this is part of the personal growth and professional growth that Corey and I went through in evaluating this because it, it was a shocker. It was a shocker. And I think Corey, part of I'll it was – I'll let you go on this one now. <laughs> right. And it was a shocker. 
I think what what really came about from it when when my team and I did it is there's yeah we ha- we everybody thinks that they have a good they have a good grasp of the knowledge, but when I evaluated a team and then uh, they evaluated themselves, it was a it was a different set of skill sets. So I was able to identify it within my team where the gaps were, where I needed to work on with them. So I was able to help uh, develop a mentoring plan, uh, develop uh, uh, improvement plans, and be able to look at look at aspects of my business that I knew that I wanted to grow that were in my business plan, that I could actually help them to help buttress those future growth aspects. So. It was actually really critical. So, Corey, give me, one of you, please, give me something specific. Like you said, it was a shocker. So, obviously, it's not not at all necessary to name names. But if it means to say, for example, I learned about myself or I learned about an employee based on the evaluation process, this is what, you know, I thought this and this is what it was. Give me an example. Tell me something that shocked you so I can get a concept of this. Sure. Well, one of one area that uh, I realized was we all thought that we were really good at uh, administering projects or administering our contract documents. And when it came down to it, when when I looked at project history and where we were actually physically challenged, it was or sorry, professionally challenged it was actually in the administration area itself. So we were terrible at doing walkthroughs and doing site evaluations uh, during construction. Yeah, sure, we can take photographs and identify things, but there was very little follow through. Mm. Uh, After that, we had no way of documenting it. We had no way of recording it. So it really helped me develop a process or a plan or something to, to work on in the future of how those things, those parts and pieces of a project get implemented really, really well. Okay. So that so it sounds like the this evaluation that you guys have developed isn't just a self-evaluation of what you enjoy or don't enjoy, but it's also an objective evaluation of like maybe the question is, when you do a site visit, what do you do? Oh, I answer, I take pictures and I take, you know, um, measurements. What do you do when you get back? Yeah, I don't ever do anything with them when I get back. Like, right, like that's what you're talking about. Like you identified that uh, a site visit really ended with the site visit and it didn't follow through to putting those pictures or those measurements in the same place the same time every time. Is that what you mean? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So there wasn't a site report done. There wasn't anything that was fed back to the client to say, hey, we did this. Look at look at what we saw or what look at what we spotted. I think we need to correct this before it gets too far down the line. Because eventually what's going to happen is something's going to get installed and it's not going to quite work out right. And uh, that's really great if you're a solo person and you can really get a grasp on that. But when you have a team, it's a little bit more of a challenge to yes. make sure everybody's on the same page. Right. So we had to develop a, de- develop a bit of a process of where those those documents live or who shares them or how do they get communicated really, really well. I can yeah. see how important that would be because I have, you know, I have ex- that's part of the experience that I go through. We could be with an interior designer measuring a project out and it's the things that, oh, when I get back, I'll find this out. Or when you get back, you'll tell me this. It's that part of it. It's like, whoa, you know, like that detail that gets wrapped around, you know what I mean? And that would be part of what you would call a site report. You know, I was out there, I measured, and I need this information from the contractor still, or this information from the homeowner still, as opposed to it just being in one person's head that that information is on, it hasn't arrived yet, right? Exactly. And I think that's really great for a solo person and you know what exactly what needs to happen. There's many, many solo designers out there. But when you want to grow and you want to scale up, you have to think about the po- the processes and the policies that you need to implement in order to keep track of all that information. And that's something that, that this self-evaluation really helped me identify my gaps. Because I went from I went from a team, uh, sort of from solo to a team very quickly in under two years. And I didn't I wasn't really set up for it. Right. So what the self-evaluation did is it allowed me to look back and say, whoa, I skipped this process or I skipped this step. And I need to really work on that. And I need to get my team better at it. Right. Well, and we say that on the show all the time, that even if you are a solo, you know, you can't count on even you remembering something. And if forget, I, I, look, I believe that a solo should run their firm as if they're a big firm. 
no matter what. And and it comes from what you just said. When you want to onboard different team members, if you have documented your processes, now you can teach them. But if it's all in your head, now they can't do anything until you explain every last step to them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, As opposed exactly. to, you know, here's how we do this. There's the manual or there's the Camtasia screenshots of it or whatever it is. Um, or even if it's just one person, you know, you teach that one person and now he can teach the next person that comes on because it is a set system and then the other side of it is is even if you say well I love being a solo I don't have any desire to have a team I did just interview somebody recently that that's exactly where she's at she goes I could see being like this you know for 10 years it's I have no desire to be bigger and there's so many people like that 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 that's their joy to just run their business but you know even if it's because you're a part-time mom I mean you're not a part-time mom you're a part-time designer because you're a full-time mom um, <laughs> can't figure that part-time mom part out right <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll just borrow you for the weekend <laughs> um, but um, the thing is you know your kid walks in the room you know their knees bleeding and did you did you miss a step? Because when you got back to it, you don't have a process. So you just pick up where you were and you forgot that you didn't do something. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's part of all this. The first part that the identify and a baseline for your personal skill set. So you identify what you like, what you're good at, what you're not good at, but you also identify, you know, the skill sets of your firm. It sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the next part of that is is because everybody's going to want to know what's next. What great, we did this. Now what? Well, I think when you can see your skill sets as a whole, whether it be as a whole as a business or a whole as a professional individual, I think you're able to identify areas that you can work on in the future. So maybe you can source out different professional development opportunities to work on certain areas. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe you don't like doing doing particular parts of detail drawings or shop drawings and hey you just realized you need to outsource that uh or you don't like doing accounting or or project billings um at like hourly time billings so yeah you need to outsource that mm -hmm. so it's it's really cool to be able to look at this as a whole and be able to identify your opportunities to keep yourself sane and have that work-life balance so okay all right. And then another area that you go into is evaluate professional development opportunities to expand your service offering. So what are you talking about there? You're talking about that once you do the self-evaluation and you find out, you know, you really love the the remodeling, the renovation part of, of design as more than, you know, the accoutrements of design. Is that is that what you're talking about? And then you start to drill down on, and focus on that? What, what are you... Well, I think when we look at evaluating your professional development opportunities, we you want to always assess yourself and what kind of designer are you? Do you want to sit for an examination and go forward? And if there's a particular area of your skill set that you're weak on, you can actually take more classes on that. That's that's certainly a good process. But if we take something very, very specific, such as, um, let's say, measuring a space and obtaining uh, your digital documentation or your photographs of the site. And that's something that you really don't really do well at. Well, maybe that's something that you could learn to supplement or outsource again, or that's something that you can start uh, reading up on or taking a course on how to do that because different, different opportunities there. But I think you can grow that and say, this is where my services currently are. And this is where I want to go because I can make more money. And uh, I think you can start aligning yourself a little bit better and slowly chip away at those things that you really don't want to do or you'll do it if you have to, uh, to be able to bring them more in line with, I'm really good at this. Okay. 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 So I, that's, I get that. And then the next component of it is to construct that core psychographics to better identify your preferred client profile. So that's sort of, we got into that in the beginning, but you teach them probably, it sounds like you teach them sort of that intake questionnaire in the different ways. And of course, this is where, you know, we touch on how it's, it's completely different for a city firm as it is for, you know, Judith and her thing, but you cover all of the different types of questions to ask so that you get telling answers? Well, and Judith will absolutely add on to this for sure. 
But where we look at our uh, personality values, attitudes, interests, lifestyles, and we drill down a little bit further to try to find out what was a really great project and what was a really bad project. Okay. So that you're able to kind of highlight those red flags now. So like when I talked earlier about the my intake process, I've had some bad projects. Don't get me wrong, mm. right? Okay. Everybody has, but I'm able to now look at it in a in a in some sort of box or container where I'm able to say, "Hey, there's some similarities happening over here okay. on on this particular category." And then there's similarities happening over here on their lifestyle choices that they like um, or what's their approach to living that I actually would rather agree with. Can I balance out their their personality with some other aspects. So, yeah. So it's like a that. process of evaluating past projects that were particularly successful from both the client standpoint, but from your standpoint as a designer, that the process was enjoyable, that the, the project was a great project, and then contrasting it to ones that you felt like were just, you know, like trudging through mud to finish it. And then looking at them and identifying what made one a positive experience and what made one a negative experience and then trying to quantify that for you if if those the reasons that it was negative were because of overarching themes of of big picture ideas that you could avoid going forward is that what you're saying Exactly. Is your is your crayon box organized or is it kind of a mess in there, right? Okay. <laughs> oh. And are all the, la- the the papers ripped off or are they all on there yeah. nice? <laughs> all the labels face the same way. Yeah, yes, exactly. yeah how crazy pants is this crayon box? <laughs> okay. All righty. And then, uh, do you, do you, Judith, did you want to add to that? Corey thought you might want to say something about that. Well, Gosh, Luann, I'm stuck on your comment about her thing. I'm trying to evaluate. Well, now I've got a her thing going on here. (laughs) I'm really special. (laughs) Well, I just honestly, I I mean, I have to say, I have had, I live here 10 miles outside of New York City, and the number of designers that I know here that have looked at me in 30 years and said, I just can't find another client. And I'm thinking, if they had to live in 10,000 people, it's like two blocks. (laughs) It's like... (laughs) <laughs> and you keep busy well, every I, week. I, I will offer I will offer a comment about that because we, we do talk about psychographics and, and Corey mentioned, you know, you have to sometimes evaluate a bad project and to be able to come up with what was what works for you on a good. And it isn't necessarily so much about the project. Because let's face it, we all know that the drywall phase is our most favorite. <laughs> and um but it's more about the client's reaction and their personality and how it aligned. Because let's face it, it's a it's a it's like a relationship. There's this dating phase that you're all excited, and then there's this marriage, and then there's this phase that you go, "Oh my God, I want a divorce from the contractor, and I want him <laughs> out of my house." And then there's a, ultimately reconciliation when they're happy when it's all done. Yeah. But it's about how the homeowner and the designer interact and engage in that process, you know, Mm -hmm. with the contractors. So it is about alignment of values. Um, You know, one of, one of the things that's very challenging in my community is, is um, we have a substantial amount of nonprofits um, functioning out there in the woods from all different um, venues or avenues in life. And so oftentimes uh, aligning values, often you have to ask what nonprofit they're participating wow. in, you know, uh, so that you can align your values to them, but also get some sense of their ethics. Mm. Um, so it is, it is very challenging. But I, I want to go back to a comment about oftentimes designers um, try and sell a whole package of skill sets. And that's where we really... Um, undo ourselves professionally is when we try to sell a skill that we really don't have or we don't want to do. And we need to find out how do we take that skill set that maybe we don't have or don't want to do and find a way to make it work for us uh, so that it doesn't diminish our professionalism, not only to the homeowner, but to the, the, to the tradespeople that we work with. 
So give and me that's an very example. challenging. Give me an example of a particular skill set that you could think would be, you know, commonly something that a designer prefers not to do or isn't good at doing. And how do you remove it from it and do what you said, save face with everybody involved? Um, I'll give you a really good example. Um, in I specialize in kitchen and bath. Um, and I occasionally cross from the tile onto the carpet and do interiors if I have to. Okay. <laughs> um, and so within the kitchen and bath, there's a lot of mechanical. And when we talk about mechanical, it's about lighting, electrical, it's everything. It's all, all the things that power, you know, runs in the kitchen. And so, yeah, I can do a mechanical plan for a kitchen layout I can do you know that has all the ceiling lighting switching everything right everything that you need to know so I can hand it to the contractor and go make this happen or and I can spend what anywhere from two to three to four hours doing that and I can bill a pretty good chunk of change for that because it is a technical drawing mm -hmm. okay or um, I can go down the highway meet with the electrician meet with Sparky, meet with the contractor, <laughs> meet with the homeowner and take my favorite roll of blue tape and a Sharpie and literally walk through the space and lay it out. Okay. And, um, and then when the homeowner says, well, what kind of reflected, uh, what kind of ceiling can should I use? Okay. Then I can say to Sparky, Sparky, what's the best product out on the market today? And that you like using is, 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 you know, the right product for this application. And because they're the expert, he'll say blah, 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 or mm -hmm. she will say blah, blah, blah. Right. Okay. Well, I can charge the homeowner, say, I don't know, a thousand dollars for that technical drawing, or I can spend a couple of hours on the job site with the homeowner, with the contractor, with the electrician and make it happen and make it look good. In other words, and Low he's responsible for the, right. well, he doesn't even need to draw it drawings. He, what you're saying is he, he now not understands it too. So he doesn't have to have a drawing by you to execute it. Correct. Okay. And so the thing is what you're saying in that is now I'm understanding your example. So the example is that don't even present that a mechanical drawing is necessary if it's not something that you like to do. Don't, don't make it a negative say, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to show up and I'm going to meet with the electrician and yourself, or I'm going to map it all out. And, you know, we've worked with him a thousand times and yada, yada, yada. And now it's a positive as opposed to what you were talking and explaining at the top of your conversation is don't make it, I used specific sentence. It wasn't don't make it a negative, but don't sell yourself on something you can't do or something you said, right? Correct. Or get yourself Correct. involved in something that you don't want to do. Don't make it because it's the truth. You're in the driver's seat. I mean, I have to say, I don't know. I mean, obviously, every single person on the planet is different and every person's experience is different. But the fact is, is I don't know that a end user actually has an expectation of what you should or shouldn't be doing for every little detail like that to begin with. So if Correct. you said to me, I'm a kitchen designer and I'm going to do mechanical drawings, I'd be like, okay, whatever. And if you said to me, I'm a kitchen designer and I'm going to meet with an electrician at I'd be like, okay, whatever, just get the kitchen done. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, whatever. <laughs> as long yeah. as the lights go on, the oven works. <laughs> so now well, we do know for... that there's people that would have had experiences and said, oh, my last kitchen designer did a mechanical drawing. And what you're saying right. is don't fall into the trap of like, hum, the, hum, the, hum, the, now I got to do a mechanical drawing. You just say, I don't do it that way. Well, correct. But there's a couple of things here. Okay. So can I do it? Yes. Do I, I want to do it? No, I don't really want to do it. Right. <laughs> right. I don't want to sit here for four hours and do it when I can drive down the highway, spend, you know, 15 minutes on the road, two hours on the job site, building relationships. Mm -hmm right mm -hmm. with my trades people on the in the community that I live come back to my desk and go do something else so it's about efficiency and a productivity but it's also about engaging relationships now on the flip side that isn't going to work for Corey no no it would never work <laughs> It would never work. I mean, we're talking digital trail here, right? Where, where's what do you mean? Where where's the power and communication plan? Where's the RCP? Where is it? Oh I don't know where these these goodness. fixtures are going. Oh, wow! Right, and that all has to be submitted for the permit review. It's just it's insane how that could flip flop right yeah. to the other side. So something that we don't really want to do because yeah, I think Judith's idea of going on site and marking everything out on site is a whole lot more efficient. Because you don't know what you don't know, right? Right, right. You, you never know it until demo. So 
by us producing all these plans and spending all the time and the energy and doing it because we have to, invariably there's going to be a markup process and there's going to be revisions right. and it's just this it's Brutal. just this balloon of <laughs> of administration time that we forget to capture right right so interesting yeah yeah no it's interesting and i so so what you're saying is as part of the ceu you are helping designers identify like you just said judith you might be capable cape capable how's that for a word you might be <laughs> You might be capable of producing a mechanical drawing, but if you don't enjoy it, then that's something to learn about yourself. And if you're in a case like Corey, if you're capable and you don't enjoy it, then you hire somebody on your team to be the person to do it or you outsource it out. Right, Corey? Is that what your guys are saying? Absolutely. But don't forget to mark it up and charge for it, right? Right, so. right, 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 right. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So the thing is that it's a lot of what it sounds like is it sounds like about 20 podcast episodes in two hours. You know, that's what it sounds like. You know what I mean? Because you're really taking all the topics that we talk about on the show and you're really drilling it down into an actionable lesson and you're getting it to be really finite and they're going to come away with this like blueprint for their business. It almost, you know, it almost sounds like to me, it sounds like psychotherapy for your design business. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> I think we're going to rename our course. Judith, I'm telling right? you. <laughs> better, we're going to end up in psychotherapy. Yes. Together, right? <laughs> but I mean, seriously, and it's just funny because you're like the psychographics and all this stuff, but it really is, you know, I mean, wh what do we all want as human beings? I want to sit down and I want to sit there and think about what, what makes me happy what makes me fulfilled? What do I enjoy doing? What do I not enjoy doing? What do I wish would get the heck out of my life and I never had to do it again? And then build a plan that supports all of those things. And they're like, I'm going to have to, like, my house has to be clean, but I can hire a housekeeper. You know, so it's like, I have to have a mechanical drawing, but I can hire somebody to do it or I can meet with the guy to do it. And, you know, so that's what it really does sound like to me is that if a designer is, you, I'm going to make an assumption now and you call me out if I'm wrong but if a designer is feeling sort of like they're running a treadmill in a circle and they can't really get some satisfaction some gratification some clarity on why the business doesn't seem to be growing or moving forward or forget growing just moving along a track in a happy way that maybe some of these things haven't been identified for themselves and they need to really spend, forget learning about the latest introduction of fabric from Romo. You know what I mean? Like figure exactly. out what you're doing every day that's inside here that's clogging up the process. Exactly. Well, I think uh, to, to, to tag on to that, because you're, you're dead on the way in, um, oftentimes we as designers were so anxious to get a project and to say yes, that we forget that sometimes we should be saying, no, I don't do certain things. That's not how I work mm -hmm. because we have to be wired to say yes to everything. Mm -hmm. And because the client expects it. Okay. But it's okay sometimes to say, well, no, I don't really do that, but I can guide you and we can find solutions. So part of it is how do you say no, but retain your professional professionalism in the eyes of the homeowner and then not set yourself up to fail. Right. Right. I love it. I love it. I think it's great. I mean, it's so funny because on the show, I'm always talking about, you know, how brilliant my husband is a business person and how so much of what we have is, you know, directly relatable to what he has taught both Bill and myself. But this is one place where I have to say I actually am a little bit better. So like I am not that girl. Like if I walk into a job and a designer wants to do something, you know, I don't know. I, I literally I'm trying to think of the conversation I had the other day. Somebody wanted to sustain spend like a drape I, I can't even go into it so because without the visual you'd never understand it but I like just looked at him I was like that is not happening you know what I mean like it's just not going to happen you know you went jersey on him that's it and you know what I mean and like what by contrast my husband w not that he does crazy things that can that don't work or whatever but Billy and I roll our eyes because he will go down that crazy low road so much further than we will go and he'll be he'll be like oh we can and I have to say if he were right here he would say 
say to me, and how many times did Billy figure out a way to do it? And I'd be like, you're right. But I'm, you know, I have no problem lying in the sand. It's not happening. That's a, you know, this isn't going to work, yada, yada, yada. So you're just really, the thing is, I think that what you're trying to express and teach is when somebody truly understands themselves and their, their, their personal skills, their professional skills, and the things that make them tick, it puts them in a position where these situations don't spin them out, that they can be more comfortable in saying, that's a great fit for me, or that's not a great fit for me, or this whole project is great, and you're great, but this portion of it, I got to figure out somewhere else to get it done, right? Yeah. Exactly, because as soon as you spin out, you got to recover, yeah. right? And it's the recovery that takes so much more longer. Yeah, so much more longer. I know we have great English <laughs> this whole show. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's really being aware of as soon as you start to spin out, like you know, just like you would learn in driver's education, turn into it, turn into <laughs> it. It doesn't doesn't necessarily work here, right? You got to turn out of it. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. So tell us about how they get involved in this course. How do they take advantage of it? I know it's May 10th. So would you want to give a little description between what you're classifying as newer in business and season so so they can identify for themselves which course they they line up with? Yeah, Well, the first one. Oh, go ahead. (laughs) Sorry. You can go ahead, Judith. Oh, thank you, Corey. Ladies Um, first. (laughs) <laughs> so the first one is, uh, let's say you're just kind of out of the box and trying to find yourself. And when I say find yourself, align yourself to a business, get some experience. Um, maybe you've been in it for a couple of years. Uh, you might be an independent designer with your design studio on the trunk of your car. You might be aligned to a showroom. You might be an independent contractor. Um, you know, so maybe you... Uh, uh, are just sort of new to the industry but have some experience. So that would be the first group and take advantage of that because uh, we'll take you through some some of the exercises that we'll do in the second. I mean, the exercises are going to be similar, but we're going to tailor it to dealing with new or how should I say um, less, well, say 10 years or under. Okay. Uh, experienced designers. Okay. Then we get the folks like Corey and I burned out, need to reinvent <laughs> ourselves. Um, you know, what's it all about, Alfie? Voices <laughs> from what's happening, you know, and, and, but m- maybe more seasoned designers that have had to reinvent themselves. Maybe they had a traditional brick and mortar business and in the depression, that closed and then they had to reinvent themselves and, and find a new way of do bu- of doing business. Maybe they are trunk designers. Everything's in the trunk of their car. Um, maybe they have a design studio or maybe they're aligned with a larger design build construction firm, or, you know, maybe they're working out of a modified closet in their house. Mm-hmm. So, or um, maybe like, is it, like I said before, is it maybe that you might be in it 15 or 20 years, but you're just not feeling like it's in a groove. It's not humming for you and you need to right. self, you know, re, re, recal- recalibrate, right? Recalculate. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. exactly. Okay. 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 So that's well, really where, cool. Where you can really find out more about the course is mm-hmm. actually uh, by going to mydomastudio.com forward slash beyond design. Love it. So the course is going to start, well, the first one is on May 10th, the newer section for newer designers, and May 18th for the more seasoned designers. And the thing about it is there's plenty of time now to get involved and to get signed up for it. And what I, the reason that I mention that plenty of time is because there is some homework that you have to do to prepare to be ready when that webinar goes live for you to have your ducks in a row so that you can take the most advantage of the information that they're going to teach you. And so let's remember it's, it is mydomastudio.com forward slash beyond design. And then when you, they get there, you guys said to me off air, this is not like, you know, you know, yakking it up here. You guys are going to work and they're going to have their stuff prepared before they get there and you're going to get right down into it, right? Absolutely. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah. Uh, well, I can imagine. We, it's like psychotherapy. <laughs> It's psychotherapy. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it is. It is a self-evaluation is and look, here's the thing. 
if a self-evaluation isn't hard, whether it's of yourself or your business, you're not really doing it, right? It is hard to look in the mirror, right? And really be honest. But if you're motivated and you're looking for either to start your business off on the right foot because you're brand new and you really want to, you know, take advantage of all the skills and all the lessons that both Judith and Corey already have gone through and have succeeded at, then that's a great thing. And if you are stuck and you're not feeling like, you know, your mojo isn't working and you just keep getting involved in project after project, Project that are not fulfilling and not, you know, having a good outcome, then, then, then this is the kind of thing that's going to help you, you know, work through that and figure out where your red flags are personally that are creating the the clog in this process, right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All righty. Well, you guys are amazing, and I'm so grateful to Sarah for suggesting this as a program because understand. Anybody who takes advantage of this CEU, I know is going to improve their business. But what I love is I'm sure that you've helped people improve their business just by being here on the podcast and sharing all your information with us today. So I I definitely do value it. And I I definitely do thank you both for joining me and helping your colleagues out there. Thank you for the invitation, Luann. My great thanks to the featured sponsor of our podcast, Kravit Inc. Of all the terrific things about Kravit, do you know about curatedkravit.com? I know you've heard me tell you all about it for this last year and a half, but have you taken a minute to really go and look and check out curatedkravit.com yet? You have to see this collection of the most unique, high-quality finished products for the home. The collection includes furniture, lighting, bedding, rugs, accessories, and more. It is so comprehensive. It features customized designs as well as unique hand-picked pieces from the global design market. CuratedKravit.com is available exclusively to the trade. That's right. No direct consumer purchasing. They have your back at Kravit Inc. And have you checked out the innovative ready-to-ship upholstery program? This is groundbreaking in our industry. Where else can you find someone that delivers custom quality furniture fast? I'll tell you where else. Nowhere else. You see, it's the combination, custom quality and fast. That is at curatedkravit.com. You can shop the site by product category, by stylized product stories, and through the curated rooms designed by the industry tastemakers. At curatedkravit.com, they are committed to making your job more efficient by providing unmatched customer service coupled with an exceptional product offering. Kravit Inc. stands firm in their mission to serve the interior design trade at the very highest level. And the last and one of the most fabulous features is the process is so simple. That's right. Design, click, deliver. Easy as that. One last thing. Kravit Inc. has a thank you to you as a listener of the podcast. If you are on the site and you are ready to make a purchase, any one purchase, you can get 10% off as their thanks to you. Enter the code CKPODCAST at checkout for 10% off any one purchase. Well, I do thank them very much, and I really do hope that you will take a moment to see how curatedkravit.com can help you run your business more efficiently. As you can see, not only are Judith and Corey truly fun and creative people, they are designers who have a solid understanding of the business side of their business. Corey said, it's not enough to know the demographic of your target client, but you have to know the psychographic of your ideal client. I love his clear understanding of his own demographic and psychographic, and the straightforward advice on how to discern this information for yourself and your team before you engage with a prospective client. And Judith's understanding that just because you're capable of executing a particular aspect of a project, if you don't like doing it or you don't want to offer it, You don't have to, and you don't have to apologize for it. You don't have to second guess yourself for it. I love it. And how about this SEU, right? 
I'm serious. It does seem like psychotherapy for your business, doesn't it? If you are stuck, if you are unfulfilled, if you find yourself in the type of project after project that you don't want to be in, this CEU has your name written all over it. Like Corey said, why take another CEU on a topic you've delved into over and over again? What do we say here all the time? Spend time working on your business, not just in your business. And this CEU just seems to be the answer for that. I'm going to say. So you can access the CEU at www.mydomastudio.com forward slash beyond design. That's www.mydomastudio.com forward slash beyond design. It's running May 10th and May 18th. So head on over and look into it and see if it's for you. Now, remember, we have our own two events coming up in May, May 15th at my showroom in Livingston, a to the trade event for a hands on my Doma studio lunch and learn. No charge. Just please RSVP on the event bright link in um, on my website at www dot windowworks nj dot com slash podcast and then the other event is two days later wednesday may 17th at ethan allen in new york city open to the trade and the public this is a rock star event with barbara vittieri of designer liberty cheryl eisen M- michael welch and manuela morietta and myself this is going to be a blast make sure you are on our me- email list to get the news on how to attend this event or in order to get on our email list, I should say, you can go to our website, www.windowworks-nj.com slash podcast, and you can sign up there. Or from your phone, you can text the word design biz, D-E-S-I-G-N-B-I-Z, to the number 444-999. Okay, so just text, just put in your phone 444-999, and then when the text screen opens up, put in the word Design Biz, D-E-S-I-G-N-B-I-Z, and that will take you through the literally 30-second process to get on our email list. Uh, So that is it for today. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate your showing up every week, and I hope you have an excellent day. Thank you for joining me again today for another episode of A Well-Designed Business. This podcast is a production of Window Works in Livingston, New Jersey, your trade resource for custom window treatments and awnings. Learn more about Window Works at www.windowworks-nj.com. All of our music is original music by Room 2 Productions. Please contact us if you want to learn more about original music for your business or your events.